This is a production of Cornell University. So thank you for that nice introduction, Alina, and thank you and Adrian for inviting me, and thank you all for talking with me today. I've had a great time talking with faculty, and I'm looking forward to talking to students soon. So as Alina says, um, I study iron homeostasis in plants, and the reason why I study it is because iron deficiency-induced anemia is a, the most prevalent nutritional disorder in the world. Right, approximately 30% of the global population suffers from anemia due to iron deficiency, and most people obtain their iron from plants right, due to socioeconomic and religious reasons. And so plants can suffer from iron deficiency, but what we want to try to do is figure out why they suffer, how they suffer, and how can we manipulate those responses to produce plants that contain more iron or tolerate low iron conditions. And so in response to iron deficiency, they go intravenal chlorosis, and in my favorite plant, Rabidopsis thaliana, you can see in addition to that, uh, dramatic changes in, in root growth and development as well. <coughs> Iron is, and it, and it's, it's doing this because it is essential for many processes, including both photosynthesis and respiration, where iron is involved in heme complexes and iron super complexes for, um, for these processes. Right. And so in response to iron deficiency, plants, depending upon what type of plant we're talking about, they can undergo two different mechanisms, strategy one response and the strategy two response. Dicots like Arabidopsis will undergo the strategy one response in, re in response to iron deficiency. So the first thing they do is that they pump protons into the rhizosphere using this um, AHA2 or related proteins. Um, this then lowers the pH and then making, and it makes iron become more soluble. So ferric iron is actually the, mo uh, it actually is the, most prevalent, is the fourth most prevalent uh, mineral in the Earth's crust. And so plants have to figure out a way to, uh, to um, solubilize that ferric iron and then reduce ferric iron to ferrous iron. Right? So in Arabidopsis, then this ferrous ion is then, is, is, is then transported into the epidermal cells by the membrane localized uh, transporter IRT1, and then it travels from the epidermis into the vasculature, i.e. The, the xylem, and it's, it moves from the xylem, the root to the shoot to the xylem. One thing that we don't really recognize a lot, or that, we, that we're just now starting to understand, is what's happening inside of specific cell types. For example, we know that there are um, iron reductase that are prevalent, um, that are prevalent in, inside in specific cell types. For example, we know that FRO3 is involved in reducing iron in the mitochondria. Nicotianamine is involved in producing a type of molecule called nicotianamine that will bind to iron in the flow and facilitate its movement. ZIF1, for example, is another um, important protein involved in facilitating the movement of nicotianamine into the vacuole. So there's a lot that's going on, not only in the epidermis, but also in more internal cell types. So when I started working on this project uh, when I was a postdoc, we knew, for example, that FIT was a key BHLH transcription factor that controlled the activity of those three genes that I told you about at the very beginning. So AHA2, FRO2, IRT1 are all controlled by FIT. And so what I was interested in is trying to figure out what's, what are some of the other key players in regulating the iron deficiency response. So to try to address this question, uh, we did a lot of microarray analysis. So microarray analysis was the hot thing to do back when I was a postdoc. Now it's RNA seq and proteomics, and but this is the this is the, the tool that we use in the lab. And so we um, developed a time course of the iron deficiency response. We're looking at whole roots between zero and 72 hours of exposure to iron deficiency, and then we saw that there was a major shift happening at the 24-hour time point. So then we sliced the root up into specific developmental zones and then checked the, the did microarray analysis. And then we looked at specific cell types. So we used fluorescence activated, I think I have a slide about that, yeah. So we used fluorescence activated cell sorting, which allowed us to isolate specific cell types that had been exposed to iron deficient conditions. So that what we could come up with is one of is the highest resolution transcriptional profile of a, of a plant root in response to iron deficiency stress. And from that, my next goal was to identify putative transcription factors and use a reverse genetic approach to try to figure out, do they play a key role in this response? And from that approach, we identified two genes, which I'll, um, which, which, which is kind of formed the basis of my lab um, to this day. Right. One of them uh, we identified and we named Popeye. So Popeye mutants show decreased iron reductase activity and decreased ability to acidify the rhizosphere. So this is called a bromocresol purple assay. So basically, as I said before, roots will um, put protons into the rhizosphere, and we can image that, that pumping of the protons, that change in pH, on this um, pH indicator media. 
right? So in contrast to wild type, hopefully you can see it, Popeye mutants show decreased rhizosphere acidification. When we grow a Popeye mutant on pH 5 to 6, it's pretty good, but when we grow it on elevated pH, in which iron is, barely, is, is, poorly, is poorly biologically available, we see that the plants will germinate, but they won't grow far beyond germination. So this is another example of the iron deficiency response, decreased tolerance to iron deficiency. However, surprisingly, our, our Popeye mutants exhibit decrease, an, an increase in the amount of iron, um, both in the root and in the shoot. So this suggests that there is a disconnect between the actual ability to uptake iron and the ability to sense and utilize that iron. So Popeye is playing some sort of role in disrupting the ability to sense and the ability to utilize iron. Mm -hmm. So to try to gain insight into how it might be doing that and the molecular mechanisms of, of how Popeye functions, well, recently uh, we've looked at the we looked at the dynamics of Popeye's activity. So my very talented student, my uh, graduate student, Juri Shawar Muhammad teamed up with Ross Susani to look at the dynamics and the movement of Popeye. So we know that Popeye, when we make a transcriptional fusion, it's expressed predominantly in the vasculature. We pretty much see it in vasculature, that's it. When we look at a translational fusion, where we can look at the protein, we can actually see that the protein seems to be localized in all cell types. All right, so this suggests that the protein moves from the vasculature to all other cell types. So we teamed up with Ross Susani to do scanning um, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy coupled with paracoalition function. So basically, this is a technique in which we can take high resolution confocal images, right? And then we can correlate the signal, the fluorescence intensity across both time and space. And this provides you with a carpet that allows you to see if the protein is moving in between cells. So as is the case for this freely diffusive GFP, or not moving in between cells, as is the case for another, a, a mo an immobile protein that we've called TMO5. So as we can see, that Popeye, similar um, to free GFP, moves in between cell types. And specifically, it moves indeed from the vasculature to the epidermis. So knowing that now the protein actually moves, we were interested in trying to figure out what that movement meant for the activity of Popeye. So she cloned the Popeye protein um, in front of vascular-specific or behind vascular-specific uh, promoter, an endodermal-specific promoter, and an epidermal-specific promoter. And then we identified lines in which the protein stayed in the individual cell types. And then we also identified lines in which the protein moved from, say, for example, the vasculature to the endodermis or from um, the vasculature to the cortex or from the epidermis to the cortex. And so then we wanted to see if we actually express these proteins, the ones uh, express these proteins in a Popeye mutant background, could it complement the function? And so, so I'll walk you through this really quickly. So here is wild type plants showing the, um, and this is under iron deficient conditions, showing the classic rhizosphere acidification, right? Here's our Popeye mutant show decrease, showing a decreased rhizosphere acidification and poor growth under iron deficient media. All right, and we can complement those functions with the full length Popeye under its native promoter. But when we actually look at um, some of the lines in which Popeye moves from the vasculature to the endodermis, or stays in the vasculature, or stays in the endodermis, uh, the, the actual uh, Popeye will continue to grow poorly under iron, condition, iron deficiency conditions and won't acidify the rhizosphere. However, when we express it, when we look at the lines in which Popeye either stays in the cortex and endodermis, or, or stays in the epidermis and moves to the cortex, the common thing here is that the plants grow better compared to our Popeye mutants. So this suggests to us that two things, that growth, or a localization of Popeye within the vasculature or in the internal cells is harmful to the plant. Whereas when we have it in the cortex and in the epidermis, particularly the epidermis, the plant seems to grow better. So localization in the cortex is essential for the function of the protein. Right. And so to try to gain insight to that, we did this very, um, well, this looks like a very complicated Venn diagram um, after we did micros. So we did, um, did RNA-seq analysis of some of our lines. So we specifically were interested in ones where Popeye moved from the vasculature to the endodermis, or from the cortex to the endodermis, or vasculature, or to the epidermis into the cortex. We're interested in trying to figure out what is the transcriptional profile? Is it different between uh, the different lines? And we were uh, actually able to identify a significant number of genes that exhibited a state change. Um, it went from off to on, or on or off, in lines, for example, in which the protein moved from the vasculature to the endodermis. So this provides us with a really exciting set of candidates 
that might explain how Popeye does what it does in specific cell types, how it's actually able to do two different things depending upon whether you have it in the vasculature and in the dermis or whether you have it in the cortex. Okay. And so that work is in preparation. We're, we're, work, we're writing that up now and hopefully we'll get some good reviews. We'll see. So, um, so that's, well, that's the story that we're working on in terms of Popeye's dynamics. So that may lead you to the question of, okay, it's moving between cell types. Well, what is it doing? So it's a BHLH transcription factor based upon homology. And so one of the first things we did was look to see what are some of its potential direct and indirect targets using microarray analysis. And we see that many genes involved in iron homeostasis as well as other processes are, just, are misregulated in the Popeye mutant background. And what I want to point out here is that Zifro and NAS, some of the three, three of the genes that I pointed out at the very beginning of the talk, are actually upregulated in the Popeye mutant background, suggesting that Popeye might be repressing their expression. We then did chip chip to see, which is another old school. Is that, would you consider chip chip an old school? <laughs> okay, it's an oldish technique um, uh, that, we, that allows us to identify direct targets. And now we used one hybrid analysis and other various techniques, but chip chip allowed us to identify direct targets. And we found that Popeye seems to be directly regulating genes involved in not only iron homeostasis, but a variety of other processes, including these three targets right here. So these three targets, so many known iron homeostasis genes are upregulated, and some of them are directly targeted by Popeye. So knowing that Popeye is a transcription factor, that is a BHLH protein, we also knew that most BHLH proteins form um, heterodimers. It will interact with other BHLH proteins that will help control its activity as a transcription factor. So we conducted a directed yeast to hybrid analysis looking at Popeye homologs that were closely, um, that, that uh, had close homology to Popeye. So here you can see that the group um, four, that Popeye falls within the group B category, but that it actually interacts with almost all of the proteins, you can't really see 104, but it interacts with 104 also. But it interacts with several of the group four C BHLH proteins, including ILR3. All right, so ILR3 shown here. So we did um, biopsy analysis to confirm that um, Popeye and ILR3 interact, um, and they interact specifically in the nucleus. And we also confirmed that Popeye interacts with some of the other homologs that we identified in our yeast 2 hybrid analysis. So Popeye's transcription factor controls many things, um, and it interacts with a Popeye homolog in the nucleus. So that leads to the question of what is ILR3 doing? So ILR3 is, a, um, is similar to Popeye, is expressed. So here is a gust transcriptional fusion of ILR3 on the plus and minus sign. is expressed specifically in the vasculature. But when we look at the protein, it seems to be localized in all cell types. So similar to Popeye, ILR3 is, is, looks like it's a mobile protein that moves from the vasculature to all other cell types. What's the phenotype under iron deficiency? So ILR3 mutants show decreased tolerance to iron deficiency, increased chlorosis, and when we make a Popeye ILR3 double mutant, we see a similar phenotype. So the, they do not seem to be, the mutants don't seem to be synergistic, suggesting that they're part of the same pathway. When we look at the expression of ILR3 in a Popeye mutant background, it seems to be elevated, suggesting that Popeye might be upstream of ILR3 in facilitating its repression. However, when we look at co-expression analysis, we see that Popeye is co-expressed with many of the well-known iron homeostasis genes, including FRO3, BLH 101, some of these are only known to, uh, you know, but BLH 101, uh, NAS4, ZIF1, these are all well-known iron homeostasis genes that Popeye is co-regulated with, but ILR3 is not co-regulated with well-known iron homeostasis genes. This suggested that maybe ILR3, although it plays a role in iron homeostasis, it plays a role in something else as well. Right? So what is that something else? Well, um, Siobhan Brady and Daniel Klebenstein had been doing a really extensive yeast one hybrid screen of still specific transcription factors. And they found that ILR3 binds to the promoter of many genes involved in glucosinolate synthesis, right? So over, gosh, I think over half of the transcription factors involved in the synthesis of enzymes involved in glucosinolate synthesis are bound to and controlled by ILR3, right? So we picked several of the enzymes that were that seemed to be misexpressed both in Popeye as well as ILR3 and checked their expression in the background of the single mutants and the double mutants. And we indeed found that um, Popeye 
seems to have the opposite effect on the expression of these genes compared to ILR3. So for example, MAM1, which is a key enzyme involved in the first step in glucosinolate synthesis, in a Papa mutant, in, in a Papa mutant background, it, the expression goes down compared to wild type, but the expression goes up in an ILR3 mutant, suggesting that Papa might be involved in the activation of MAM1, whereas ILR3 is involved in repression of MAM1. So they seem to have opposing roles. So then we teamed up with um, Daniel Klebenstein, who is the glucosinolate guru, and we measured glucosinolate responses. And um, the results were not as clear cut as what I wanted to, I wanted to see, you know, clear cut up and down for ILR3 and Popeye. But what we did find is that there were effects. We found that ILR3 did seem to glow up in both, um, in the roots, in both, um, we found that, sorry, we found that glucosinolate did seem to glow up in an ILR3 mutant background in both the double mutants as well as the individual mutants, particularly in the root. And we didn't see as dramatic of an effect on, I, on a Papa mutant background. We also seen, saw that these effects were somewhat iron deficiency dependent. So this suggests that ILR3 and Popeye act, to, act in an opposing way to modulate the synthesis of glucosinolates under iron deficiency. To see if this had any biological and physiological relevance at all, we teamed up with Eric Davis, who is a plant pathologist who works on cyst nematodes and soybeans. And so, and which, which also affects Arabidopsis plants. So we checked the expression of ILR3 with our gust lines um, in, uh, under plus and minus iron at the same age plants as what we normally use to look at cyst measurements, look at cyst infections. And then we infected both iron sufficient and iron deficient plants, or plants that have been grown under these conditions, to the cyst nematode. And um, we were able to see that under iron sufficiency, even we can see an increase in the activity or expression of ILR3. So this suggests that somehow the cyst infection induces the expression of, these, of this gene. So then we actually um, quantify the actual infection of the cyst nematode of plants that were exposed to both plus and minus iron in both Popeye mutant, ILR3 mutant, and a double mutant background. And we found that indeed there was a decrease in the infection rate in the ILR3 in a double mutant background, suggesting that the increase in the amount of glucosinolates contributes to the decreased infection of cyst nematodes. And we picked cyst nematodes because they're wounding pathogens um, that, uh, because they're wounding pathogens and glucosinolates are induced in response to wounding. Okay. I feel like I'm going kind of fast. I am going fast. Let's do it a little bit. You guys start at 12.20, right? Okay. I'm used to 12.30. I'm like, 10 minutes in. No, I can't be 10 minutes. So anyway. All right. So, uh, so yes, Popeye and ILR3 seem to play this opposing role potentially in glucosinolate synthesis, perhaps in response to iron deficiency. And so the, the model that I published uh, is that Popeye controls ILR3, and then um, ILR3 plays this role in both iron homeostasis and in glucosinolates, whereas Popeye is controlling other things in addition to ILR3. Um, that plays an overall role in iron homeostasis. All right. So, and that's kind of illustrated here. So we, at this point, we were able to add Popeye to this regulatory network. And we knew that Popeye seems to be directly repressing genes that play a known role in iron homeostasis. Now we can add to this, um, to this network also that Popeye directly interacts with several homologs, including ILR3. Right. And we can also keep in mind that Popeye is a mobile protein that plays a role in controlling iron homeostasis, even though, it's, even though it seems to disconnect the ability to sense and utilize that iron that's inside of the plant. And we add on to this, we layer on to this, this fact that Popeye seems to be repressing ILR3, which plays a role in repressing glucosinolate synthesis. So somehow this interplay modulates glucosinolate synthesis under iron deficiency. So I've spent the majority of this time talking about the first gene that we identified, which is Popeye. Right? But the second gene that we identified during this initial screen was a gene that we named Brutus, because in contrast to Popeye, Brutus mutants grow better than wild type under iron deficient conditions. So now we have Brutus versus Popeye. Right? So in addition, as, and as you can see here, when we look at rhizosphere acidification, we see a dramatic increase in the ability to acidify the rhizosphere which can help to explain why the plants grow better under iron deficient conditions. Mm -hmm. So my graduate student, Rosalind Samir, uh, made a Brutus 
um, promoter gus, uh, transcriptional gus fusion, and we can see that indeed the, um, the gene seems to be induced in response to iron deficiency. Um, when we look at the shoes, however, it seems to be in our hands constitutively expressed. When we look at floral tissues and, re and reproductive tissues, we see, it is constitutive, we see that it's constitutively expressed. And we also see that the expression seems to fade out over time as the, as the leaves reach senescence. We were really intrigued by this expression pattern and it suggested that Brutus might play some potential role in loading iron into the seed. And this was particularly interesting because we also knew that there were embryo lethal alleles of Brutus, right? So here are some of our Brutus um, alleles that we've identified. But some of the embryo lethal alleles um, suggested that perhaps this role, you know, Brutus, is, it has substantiated the idea that Brutus is playing some sort of role in loading iron into the seed during development. Right. So these alleles uh, show arrest at two different stages of embryo development. And so we went back to all these alleles and we looked at embryo lethality. And we can see that Brutus alleles do show an increase in embryo lethality. And we measure the amount of iron that was associated with the seeds. And we can see that both iron and zinc are elevated in these Brutus mutants. And we can actually visualize this when we stain using pearl staining. So this suggests that loss of Brutus function leads to an increase in the amount of iron in the seeds, and then this leads to iron, then this leads to um, arrested development during embryogenesis. <laughs> so it suggests that Brutus represses iron uptake, or make sure that we don't have too much iron um, that's transported into the developing seed. Okay. So how is Brutus able to do this? What, what type of protein does it encode? As I said initially, we were looking for transcription factors in our initial screen. And I pulled this out because it had a CHY zinc finger DNA potential DNA binding domain. So I was really excited about this and I presented it at lab meeting and Jose Dennedy, I don't know if you guys know him. Uh, Jose was like, why are you focusing on this? We should be focusing on this and this. And I was like, oh, maybe he's right. So, so, um, so I started looking more at these other interesting domains and uh, one that I'll talk about first is this E3 domain. So um, E3 ligases actually facilitate the ubiquitination of target proteins. So it pairs up with E1, E2, and then this E3 will actually cause ubiquitin molecules to be transferred from E2 um, to the substrate. And once it's tagged with multiple ubiquitin chains, it's um, targeted for degradation by the 26S proteasome. Right. So then we tried, to, in order to figure out what Brutus might be facilitating the degradation of, we conducted uh, yeast one, a, a, a non-biased yeast uh, two, Yeast to hybrid screen. So we uh, pulled out, we made a cDNA library of the root, and we tried to identify things that Brutus might be interacting with from this library using this yeast screen. And so we found that Brutus interacted with several proteins, two of which were the same family of proteins that Popeye physically interacted with. So now I had a story where you have Brutus and Popeye, they actually might be doing something together. They may be playing a role together in this whole, in this whole story. Right? So so then we went back and we checked to see if Brutus and Popeye interact. They do not interact. However, Popeye, uh, however, Brutus does interact with Popeye homologs. Right? So we went back and we did bio, uh, BIFC, and we saw that Brutus interacted, for example, with ILR3, but Brutus does not interact with Popeye. So this is just showing you BIFC in the Christiana Benthamiana samples, um, in which, which were expressing uh, RFP fused to a nuclear tag. So if you see a green signal appeared with the red signal, you know that's interacting at the nucleus. Right? And so we also confirm this with co-immunoprecipitation. Right? However, when you remove the E3 domain, you lose the interaction between Brutus and ILR3. You can see that here as well as on our co-IP. This suggests that Brutus's interaction with the Popeye light proteins requires the E3 domain. Right? So now the next step was to show that Brutus is actually indeed enzymatically an E3 ligase. So for this, we used in vitro ubiquitination. And the person who did this, and I'm sorry, I don't have his picture here, very talented postdoc, Devarshi Salote, who was actually a postdoc in Olina's lab. So I managed to, and you know, I was grateful that I was able to, to, to recruit Dev because Dev was fantastic. Right? So Brutus is a really tough protein to work with. So anything, any data that he brought in that, that was related to Brutus, I was always excited about because no one else could had his hands to work with it. So 
Um, so basically what this is, is, is an in vitro ubiquitation assay. And what I want you to notice is that when you had, you know, you have your E1 and your E2 brutus, and you're looking for the formation of uh, ubiquitin, ubiquitin tags, right? You can actually see that when, am I getting ahead of my house? A little bit, yeah, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, right. What I want you to focus on is that you can actually see the formation of these ubiquitin tags here, right? suggesting that it is, and, and, and I'll explain the rest of this in a few slides from now. So we saw that it actually seems to actually form these ubiquitin chains, and when we remove the E3 domain, you see a, a loss of the formation of these polyubiquitin chains, suggesting that it is an E3 ligase. So when we do cell-free degradation assays, we can see that you can actually see the accumulation of ILR3 in a Brutus mutant background, but not in wild type. All right, and this all seemed to be relied upon the presence of NG132, suggesting that Brutus is indeed facilitating the degradation of ILR3. Oops. And we can also see this in vivo when we look at the presence of ILR3 translation diffusion in a Brutus mutant background. So now we have evidence that Brutus is indeed an E3 ligase. What about these other domains? All right, so these are hemerythrin domains that have, in mammalian cells had been shown to bind iron in these, um, bind iron in these oxygen pockets. Right? So we had a potential iron binding motif. To try to figure out if Brutus indeed directly binds iron, we purified the protein. We made a, a maltose binding protein, his tag version of Brutus. And then we made another version when we removed the hemerythrin domains. And you can see that they, and, and then we can look back to the mass spec. We see a dramatic decrease in the amount of iron and zinc associated with the hemorrhythmic domains, suggesting that Brutus does facilitate uh, interaction with iron. Or that Brutus brides iron. Uh oh, what did I do? Okay, sorry. So, the, but the really cool thing is that when we in vitro transcribe and translated the protein in the presence, of increasing amounts of soluble iron, we see that the protein goes away, suggesting that it's destabilized in the presence of increasing amounts of iron. When we remove the hemiurethrin domain, we remove this entire chunk, we see that the protein remains stable in increasing amounts of soluble iron. This suggests that the binding of iron facilitates the degradation of Brutus. Mm -hmm. And we were also gratified to see that when, uh, that we're also gratified to see that when we look at, um, our Brutus hemerythrin domain, we can see the protein is much more stabilized, it's much more prevalent um, than the version in which the, than the full length protein. Right? And it's much more prevalent than when you remove the E3 domain. So the hemerythrin domain is not only responsible for binding on, it's responsible for the stabilization of the protein. So now I'll go back to this image, and you can see in the presence of E1 and E2, when you remove the hemerythrin domain, you see a much more dramatic increase in the amount of monoubiquitin chains. This suggests that the stabilized version of the protein is really strongly an E3 ligase. And likewise, when you remove the hemerythrin domain, it acts very much like wild type in that the ILR3 is no longer present. Okay. So now we can add to this model the idea that Brutus is interacting with these Papa homologs and facilitating their degradation. And what I think this might be doing is, in the absence of iron, you see an increase in the amount of Brutus that's transcriptionally induced, you see the protein accumulating, and then once the, uh, the plant gets sufficient amounts of iron, it binds to Brutus and it's rapidly facilitating its degradation, allowing the tight control of iron homeostasis responses in response to changes in iron content. I don't know if the rest of the field buys it, but that's my <laughs> current model for right now. Right. Um, what time, what time is it in? One? One, ten. One, ten. One ten. Okay, great. So um, another thing that I wanted to point out with respect to Brutus is that these are not the only things that Brutus seems to interact with in that yeast to hybrid analysis. They also interact with another, so another transcription factor, which is not a BHLS transcription factor, and a gene called important alpha, which encodes a protein that may be involved in nuclear localization. So we were really intrigued by this interaction and decided to kind of follow up on it as well. And we were interested in VOS2 because VOS2 plays a role in abiotic stress response, such as drought stress, as well as response to pathogens, and studies that shown that it was degraded in an MG132-dependent manner. 
So it was like a no-brainer. I was like, oh, it must be interacting with Brutus and it's facilitating his degradation, right? So we wanted to, to follow up on that. So we went back to our bias C analysis and we showed that indeed, Brutus seems to act with Vos2 in the nucleus and the cytosol. It also interacts with inaportin in the nucleus. When you remove the E3 domain, we lose the interaction with Vos2, but we don't lose the interaction with important. So this suggests that Brutus interacts with proteins, like specifically with transcription factors, and maybe it facilitates their de degradation. But when it interacts with something that's not a transcription factor, like this important protein, it doesn't facilitate its degradation. It does interact, but maybe the important protein is facilitating its movement into the nucleus. Who knows? And so to verify this, we went back to our selfie degradation assay. And the first thing that I'll point out is that no matter what you do with important, it's always there. But when you have your, when you look at VOS2, you see that it's degraded in the presence in an MG132 dependent manner. A Brutus mutant, not degraded. Right. When we look at our um, Brutus mutant, which has the full length protein, or a, Br a Brutus mutant where you have the protein with the hemiurethral domain removed, you don't see the protein. So the protein is, is, is degraded, but it's not degraded when you remove the E3 domain. Again, showing that Brutus is facilitating the degradation of VOS2 in a way that it was doing with the Popeye proteins. But it's not facilitating the, great, the degradation of, of important. So we wanted to see what's the biological relevance of this. Maybe Brutus is doing something outside of iron homeostasis. So we went back and we um, obtained a VOS2 antibody from um, colleagues in uh, uh, Yashao, it's a Japanese group, and he actually ended up being our uh, co author on the paper. And what we found is that in increasing amounts of drought stress or cold stress, VOS2 expression or VOS2 protein goes down. But when we look at the Brutus with the GFT, GFP tag Brutus, we see that the protein accumulates. So in the presence of increasing amounts of Brutus, there's decreasing amounts of VOS2. Further correlation that this interaction between the two leads to VOS's degradation. The final thing we did was check the drought stress response. All right. And so in a VOS2 mutant, studies that shown that compared to wild type, they were more tolerant to drought, drought stress. So we suspected that a VOS2 mutant would be very similar to the overexpression of Brutus in terms of, of drought response. And indeed, we saw that when we overexpress Brutus, we see an increase in drought tolerance, very similar to what happens when we look at the loss of function mutants for VOS1 and VOS2. Right, so, that's, so that's suggesting that maybe Brutus is doing something in terms of drought response through its interaction with Vos. All right. So now we have another layer to this regulatory network. And in between this time that we've been working on this, a whole lot of other labs have, 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 have become interested in the story and have added new players to the story as well. So the story is getting more and more complex. Just last week, a whole other set of transcription factors came that were involved in this response. So it's a really exciting time to be working in this, in this field. And so in the last few minutes, I'll finish up with a story that we've been developing that's working with um, engineers, making, using more of a, a modeling approach, a mathematical approach to gain insight to this whole process. So we went back to our time course analysis, and I approached Dr. Kranos Williams and his very talented graduate student um, to try to see if we could utilize this data to try to identify new players in iron homeostasis. And so the overarching question that we were interested in asking is, if there are some known iron homeostasis genes that are induced and repressed within 24, 48, or 72 hours, can we identify things that are upstream of it based upon uh, the expression pattern of some of these genes um, that are occurring earlier on in the process? Right? And so there are many different ways that we can do this. And this is just a picture from a, a, a review that describes some of the different algorithms or approaches that you can take to try to identify relationships between genes down here with genes up here. Right? And so one of the things that you can do is you know, input the iron deficiency response genes, you cluster them, and then you make identify relationships based upon expression patterns. So that was our first, uh, our first aim in, in, in doing this project. And so we developed an algorithm to try to address this question. So we call this the CDAA algorithm, the Cluster and Differentiation Alignment uh, Algorithm. 
And so we picked a set of well-known iron homeostasis genes, and we used this algorithm and, and identified a number of genes that may be regulating them that had no known role in iron homeostasis genes, iron homeostasis response. And so then we ordered the mutants for all of these and then checked the expression of their putative targets using straightforward QRT-PCR analysis. And so then we also had a control. And so what we found is that in over 60% of the cases, we were able to recapitulate that these genes affected the expression of these genes. Right? However, we were not often able to um, predict the directionality of the expression. So for example, we predicted that ETF9 would activate the expression of a lot of these genes, and it turns out it actually represses. Right? And so to, to further validate this network, we sent, um, because we had the promoter for Popeye, we sent the promoter for Popeye to Siobhan Brady to do her yeast one hybrid analysis, and she was able to indeed find that ASL2 binds to the promoter of Popeye. So this added some biological validation to our network. <coughs> So what we've been more recently interested in is moving beyond the static relationship to try to understand dynamics of that relationship. How does modulating the expression of these genes affect the expression of these genes? Can we develop, um, can we develop a, an equation that explains these relationships? But to do these, we actually had to include the new players that were being developed between 2015 and 2018. So these uh, key players came up as being regulating is regulating some of these known iron homeostasis genes as well. So knowing this new network, we decided to create, or to try a mathematical approach. We created um, a version of an ordinary differential, ordinary differential equation, ODE, that took into effect things like the an, an unknown iron deprivation signal, the degradation rate of the transcripts, the idea that some things might be constitutively transcribed, um, um, other unknown iron related effects. So there were, it spent us, it took us quite a bit of time and quite a bit of back and forth to try to create an ODE that took into account a variety of different parameters, many of which we didn't know. And so what we ended up with is the ability to be able to predict what happens when we look at combinatorial effects. So for example, when we look at the expression of say MIB10, which is, which is down here, what happens when we look at the effect of multiple modulators on its activity? All right, so here's MIB10. This is expression in wild type plants under iron deficiency. All right, in our single mutants, the expression of MIB10 looks like this in a 104 mutant background. This is one of its regulators. All right, this is another one of its regulators, and here's the double mutant. So then we can take the, we can take the information about the expression pattern of MIB10 in the background of 104 or the background of ILR3. And then we can use this mathematical model to predict what would happen to this expression pattern in a double mutant, right? And so in over 50%, and so in the majority of the cases, we were able to predict what would happen to the expression pattern looking at higher order mutants. So now with this, these new approaches that we've been taking with our engineering colleagues, we are able to further enhance this regulatory network by adding in another layer of regulators, and some of, and I'm I only showing ASO2 here because I know it actually directly regulates Popeye, but the, the network extends to some of these new players as well. All right, and with that, just a little clear time, I'd like to thank all of my, uh, the various people that have collaborated with me, um, in, in particular, Masa Sato, who was our collaborator for the VOS2 project, Eric Davis, Daniel Klebenstein, I also have a collaboration, of course, Siobhan. I also have collaborations going on with John McDowell and Uka Hiri or Utero on projects that I didn't have time to talk about today. Kratos Williams, Joel DeCoste, James Tuck, and of course, Ross Uzani. Um, and then a variety of undergraduate, graduate students and, and postdocs, and particularly Dev Salote, Rosalind Samira, and Duri Shawar and Anna Stallman, who've been key in doing some of the stuff that I've talked about. And I also like to thank, of course, the National Science Foundation, and NCSU for small pockets of funding. Thank you. When you made when you made your network, you said that uh, and you tested it. You said a lot of times the arrows were wrong in the prediction. Do you have any idea why it's not predicting arrows? Um, I think so that when you look at just based upon expression patterns, you would predict that when something goes up. 
And if the target goes up, you predict it will go up. But sometimes you can have something that goes up, but it's actually having a repressive effect. And so I don't think we, were, we didn't really take that into, to, into account. Plus, we were looking at the effect of multiple modulators. So we can have something that goes up and it's repressing, and another thing goes, that goes up and activates. And I think that this is where we, and I keep using this term with our graduate students, who, um, I think this is where we're getting into the area where we're no, no longer looking at low-hanging fruit. We're really trying to figure out what are all of the things that control the expression of X, Y, and Z, whether it's an activator or a repressor. So it makes it more difficult, but it also gives us, it gets a deeper, this is deeper into answering the questions of what controls gene expression. Um, so I thought the expression and movement of POP5 throughout the different cell types never was really interesting. Do you think there's any functional reason for it to be expressed in one place and move? Is it environmentally responsive or? It's not environmentally responsive. If you, you can see it very well, but it seems to be localized in all cell types under both plus and minus iron. So I don't think an iron deficiency is making it move. I do think that where it's localized determines what its binding partners are, and then that determines what its downstream targets are. But in terms of iron deficiency, it's just making it accumulate more. It's not changing, it's, it's not causing it to move, which would have been cool. But, you know. Other questions? Are you going to further investigate the mathematical modeling uh, or are you satisfied with the predictive capabilities? No, we'd love to further investigate. The thing is, you just need more data. So we need to look at kinetics. We need to look more carefully at cell type specific. So right now, we're, we're trying to create a similar model looking at um, genes that are, we're looking at a specific cell type. So that model was predicted, was based upon data from whole root microarray analysis. Right now, we're trying to focus, we're doing the same thing with an RNA-seq on the epidermis, same time course but we're trying to use that same model. We're hoping that we'll get a cleaner model because we don't take into effect, you know, things that are moving between cells or things that are, uh, you know, are really not, you know, we're trying to try, really trying to hone in on what's happening in a specific cell and not get diluted effects we're looking at the whole root. But yeah, I'd love to work with, um, to, to delve deeper into the model. I just need hands and, and interested students. But Kranos's his lab is really, really keen on that, yeah. In Brutus, is the so is the finger domain actually doing anything? I don't know. That's something that I never tested. Once I got distracted by the E three domain and the humor, I was like, yeah, <laughs> but it, it may very well be acting as some sort of transcriptional regulator, or it may be binding to zinc, or maybe binding to some other other metal. But that's something that we've 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 cloned those individual domains. I just haven't had time to really delve into what they could, but it could be. I'm just curious, but Brutus binds zinc. It does. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, uh, so zinc binding to Brutus, does it affect the stability of the We didn't check that. We just looked at it. And that's, you know, and I was so focused on iron that I didn't check zinc, but that's something that we should, that we should check. I mean, it, it could very well be that it's just as unstable in the presence of increased amounts of zinc also. It would be really cool if, that if it wasn't. Prices. Exactly. That would be exactly. It would be really cool if it didn't. Yeah. Other questions? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.